Hi, welcome to Hindustan Times. I am Jayashree Nandi. Today we have with us Mr. Alok Sharma. He is the COP26 president. COP26 is the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference, which is going to be held in Glasgow in November. Welcome to Hindustan Times, uh, Mr. Sharma. Mr. Sharma will be visiting India later this week to meet officials, ministers on the a crucial issue of climate change and to discuss uh, various uh, negotiations related matters in the run up to cop26 the ipcc report has indicated that it is possibly now inevitable that we will breach the 1.5 degree goal do you think as a global community we have done so little and so late that we have now reached a point of no return well, the IPCC report, I think, is a real wake-up call for the whole world. And um, I think uh, what it does say, of course, is that the door is still ajar, if I can put it like that. Um, but uh, it's likely to close very fast unless we collectively take uh, more ambitious action on cutting emissions. And um, you know, the, the report has very importantly uh, uh, pointed out that it is actually human activity that has been causing the global warming, the climate change that we are seeing around the world. And this next decade is going to be absolutely decisive in terms of uh, taking action. So what we cannot do is wait two years, five years, 10 years before every country comes forward and sets out ambitious plans and then the actions to deliver them. We need to take right. that action right now. Right. Yes. Um, the IPCC also uh, has spelled out that it is critical that the that parties move to net zero emissions by 2050 to even attempt keep, keeping global warming under 1.5 degree or 2 degree. Um, how will you ensure as as COP26 president, uh, how will you ensure that all, pa all parties commit to net zero goals? And are you also expecting developing countries like India to commit to a net zero target? Well, Jeshu, I, I was, as you know, in, in India some months ago, and obviously I'm, yes. I'm coming again. Uh, and yes. the, message, the message that I delivered in Delhi to ministers is entirely consistent with the message that I delivered to every government that uh, we must do absolutely everything we can to keep 1.5 degrees within reach. And part of that is uh, coming up with ambitious commitments to cut emissions by 2030, those, those 2030 NDCs, but also for all countries to commit to net zero by the middle of the century. Now, um, when we took on the COP26 presidency, um, less than 30% of the global economy was covered by a net zero target. We're now at 70%. Yes. Uh, yes. And you've seen, you've seen all the G7 countries come forward with uh, net zero commitments. You've seen China set out its plan for um, uh, uh, net zero by 2060. 2060. You've seen Brazil. Yes. Yeah, Brazil has come forward uh, with 2050. Um, so you are seeing countries moving forward. But of course, uh, you know, we want every country to come forward and set out those, uh, those plans to go to net zero by uh, the middle of the century. And I think uh, the, uh, uh, the IPCC report uh, clearly, uh, uh, you know, points to exactly why we need to do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, just a follow up question to this. Uh, India and other developing countries uh, believe that the Paris Agreement principles of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities is being undermined because the promised finance of $100 billion per year hasn't come through yet. How will you gain their trust now? I mean, um, is there a mechanism to ensure that this finance uh, actually comes through? I, I've been very clear uh, since I took on the, the, the role of, uh, of, of uh, president for COP26 is that uh, delivering on this $100 billion uh, a year from 2020 to 2025 is very much a matter of trust uh, for developing countries. And uh, for me, this is a totemic figure. And that is why I have been resolute in calling on all donor countries to come forward with more ambitious uh, 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 commitments when it comes to climate finance. Now, the good yes. news is that we saw new money coming forward from uh, Germany, from Japan, and from Canada uh, at the end of the G7 Leaders Summit. Uh, yes. And uh, obviously, the UK itself has committed a double R climate finance commitment from 2021 to 2025. Um, 
Yes. I also uh, held a, a ministerial meeting where we had around 50 ministers coming together, many of them physically, but some of them virtually, uh, on the 25th and 26th of July in London. Yes. And one of the issues that uh, is being taken forward is uh, the uh, production of a clear delivery plan on the 100 billion. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I am working on that uh, uh, together with uh, ministerial colleagues from the German government and from the Canadian government. So, And I hope that we can set out a delivery plan on the 100 billion a year before COP26. So it will inject confidence into the developing countries that... Uh, you know, this, this, this funding is going to be uh, uh, delivered on. I'll, I'm going to read out some numbers uh, from the Bloomberg NEF uh, fact sheet, which released last month. It said that some of the G20 countries have provided uh, USD 3.3 trillion support for coal, oil, gas, and fossil fuel power between 2015 and 2019. The, and Eight of the countries of the forum, uh, Australia, Canada, US, Brazil, France, Indonesia, Mexico, and China, increased their support to the fossil fuel industry during this period. I was just wondering, how would you address this, considering that you're expecting developing countries to move forward and um, you know raise their ambition, but at the same time, the, the support to fossil fuel industry uh, or the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry hasn't come down from the developed world. Um, so j just going back to your point on finance, I'll, I'll address the issue on, on sure. uh, fossil fuels, but just on finance. Uh, I mean, the other point that I have made and I continue to make to uh, donor countries that have not stepped forward with ambition yet is that they have an opportunity at the UN General Assembly uh, to set yeah. out further commitments. And I think that's going to be really important because uh, it is one of those last moments before COP26 for new pledges to come forward to have real impact uh, as well. Uh, so that is the point that I'm pushing on. On, on the issue of uh, fossil fuel, you know, I, I've been very clear that um, I want COP26 to be the COP that consigns coal power to, to history. And yes. um, if you look at um, uh, what the G7 countries uh, have, have done, I mean, I, I some months ago, I... I uh, uh, co-chaired the um, uh, climate and, uh, and uh, environment ministers uh, meeting uh, yes. of the G7 uh, nations. And one of the commitments that was made at that and was then reinforced in the communique from the leaders meeting was that G7 nations would from this year uh, end the financing of international coal projects uh, overseas. Uh, yes. We've had the same commitment, of course, from South Korea, uh, which is very welcome. Uh, and I think more broadly, in terms of, of coal particularly, I think private sector uh, investors are increasingly reluctant to invest in coal because uh, from their perspective, uh, they can see that over the next uh, a few years, they may end up with stranded assets. Uh, and if you look at the market right. itself, it is moving in the direction of renewables. I mean, uh, you know, to take India, for instance. I think it's, uh, India's got a really ambitious plan to go to 450 gigawatts of, yes. of renewables. And I think you're seeing that across the world as well. So there is a move, the market is moving against uh, uh, coal, uh, and uh, there is a, a real sort of desire, I think, amongst many countries to move forward with, with renewables. One of the key issues of this in terms of financing is that how do we help and support uh, uh, developing countries, particularly to access uh, private finance uh, when it comes to money coming into into renewables, uh, and that of course is is also part of the work that we are doing uh, in our COP26 agenda. So uh, India had recently submitted a statement uh, as part of the G20 ministerial, where they said that uh, you know reducing emissions to net zero by mid-century, pro as proposed by some countries, will not be adequate in view of the fast depleting carbon space. And then they went on to say that there. India's per capita emissions are far lower than the global average. Um, they are about seven times lower than that of the US, 3.4 times lower than China, three times lower than uh, EU. So I, I'm, I'm just wondering, is it fair to ask uh, countries with extremely low per capita emissions to switch to net zero emissions? And do you see that happening? How would you, how can that transition happen? Yes, yeah, I think the key issue here is uh, uh, is, is about clean growth. Um, I've always been very clear is that 
Um, we cannot ask any developing country which is uh, growing its economy rapidly uh, to, 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 to not grow. Um, and clearly, uh, if you are a growing economy, you will have uh, increasing uh, energy needs. Um, what I think we will do is obviously to support uh, countries to leapfrog uh, the, if I can put it like this, the, the, the sort of the dirty power that has fueled uh, the industri industrialization in uh, many of the developed nations uh, and to yes. support them uh, to move uh, towards this uh, clean energy revolution. And as I said, you know, I, I'm incredibly impressed uh, in all the conversations that I've had with, with uh, friends and ministerial colleagues in India in this yeah. real desire to push forward uh, on, on renewables. And I think that is, that is what we, we need to see uh, across all countries. And if you look at the, the, the price of renewables, I mean, if you look at solar, for instance, over a 10-year period, the price of solar has fallen by over 80%. Uh, the, uh, the price of, of, of wind has fallen by... 50% in the UK, we have managed to develop the biggest offshore wind sector in the world, bigger even yes. than China's, and we're going to quadruple that. Uh, and um, that's why, uh, and, 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 and by the way, the, the, the price of offshore wind in the UK has come down by over 70% over wow. a 10 year period. Um, but that's also why we have managed to take uh, the amount of coal in our electricity mix from 40% of electricity coming from coal power to uh, less than 2% now, and we will have no more wow. coal. We will have yeah. no, more, no more coal in our electricity mix by 2024. So right. you know, green growth is possible, and I know that's an agenda that every country wants to drive forward. One last question. Um, COP26 is uh, is a make or break conference. Um, it's 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 actually it, it's going to determine the future of the humanity. Um, do you have any worries that some countries may block progress? Uh, are you stressed about it? Well, uh, uh, you know, we, we've been working uh, as a team. We've been working very hard. Um, uh, since we, we took on this, this presidency role, uh, you know, I have been, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with the, 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 the overall feedback that I get from governments that I talk to, that they want to see uh, uh, COP26 be successful. But at the end of the day, of course, this is going to require compromise on, uh, you know, some of the, the uh, outstanding matters that still have to be uh, resolved. I think there is yeah. still a lot of hard work uh, to do between now and COP26. Uh, but as you say, I mean, this is uh, a, a, a crucial juncture for our planet. And I do believe this is our last best hope uh, of ensuring yes. that we keep 1.5 within reach. Uh, and, you know, this isn't just about, um, you know, our generation. The decisions that this set of leaders take will impact on younger generations, on future generations. And, um, I, you know, one, one, one uh, 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 thing I would say to you is that uh, for a child that is, uh, that is born uh, today, uh, whether that's in India or the UK or in, in, in China or Brazil or the US, uh, wherever that child may be born, before she or he has completed their primary education, uh, the future of the planet and therefore their future will be set. And I think that is a, uh, a, uh, a stark message yes. that I think every government needs to understand. Uh, this is about the future of, uh, of humanity itself, uh, and we need to do everything we can to avoid the uh, climate catastrophe that would otherwise engulf us if we do not yes. make the right progress and keep 1.5 within reach at Glasgow. Powerful message. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Sharma. Uh, welcome to India next week. Um, we are, I'm hoping that uh, there will be more, uh, you know, developments, news stories that we'll be covering. And thank you very much for your time. I understand that all. you must. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. No, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so yeah. much for doing this. And we'll, um, yeah. we, we, we'll, uh, we'll speak again, I'm sure.